Welcome to the latest episode of Wall Street Wildlife. This week, two big topics. Christoph and I had a bet on NVIDIA earnings. We're going to see how that played out. We will also talk about Enovix's earnings report and conference call with our guest, Mr. Not Advice, who uh, has, I think, a very well-informed, both bear and bullish, non-biased perspective on this darling fintwick company so can't wait to hear what he says look forward to hearing about that i'm luke the badger hallard my buddy is christoph monkey pikarski uh welcome to the wall street wildlife podcast all right badger so uh yesterday was a big day for the market where maybe the world's most important company nvidia reported earnings and the entire market was on the edge of its seat in part because if the results were bad the market was going to be blood red. If the results were good, the market would be happy. And you and I, being the professional degenerate gamblers that we are, decided, can we pass up a situation like this without wagering some obscene amounts of whiskey on the outcome, which is exactly what we did. It is, because we're going to be seeing each other in March. We can now confirm I am dragging my ass to Austin, Texas, where it turns out I will be buying a flight of whiskey for Christoph, because how did the bet play out? That's right. So, in, well, first what happened was we tried to psych each other out, being the not only degenerate uh, gamblers, but the degenerate poker players that we are. I initially started talking about how I thought the stock was going to go down and uh, that it's already way overvalued, yada, yada, yada. And you said, yeah, me too, me too. And then when we started uh, to actually give our price predictions, <laughs> it was the old PSYOP. <laughs> <laughs> so if I recall, Badger, you, you thought NVIDIA would close at $750, correct? Correct. And the, at the time of uh, the bet, I think it was about 720 So I was bullish to the upside. So we were thinking your your bet was like it was going to go up a lot uh, with 750 but I did you one one even better I said it would close at 798 and it was incredibly close I was on the ski lifts all day yesterday at Snowbird in Utah and literally every time I got on a chairlift I was checking the stock price it was right in the middle of 750 and 798 for the majority of the day See, that's when you know we've got problems. When you're <laughs> when you're when you're on uh going up a mountain on a ski lift checking uh the price of Nvidia. But <clears throat> Badger, what do you think these results mean? Uh well, I mean, I think it's justified because what their year over year data center revenues up like 400% and that's on top of a massive number already last year. So, yeah, I buy it. They've managed to keep the party rocking for at least another quarter. And I'll add that the margins that, that they're bringing about are insane. And I think I said to you on our last episode that I'm highly skittish and skeptical of the semiconductor industry at these valuations right now. But NVIDIA is the one company whose fundamentals I understand well enough because I've listened to however many hundreds of hours of of research about them, I am confident that this company has a moat and their product, including the software language program CUDA on which their chips run, I mean, uh, the software runs on the chips, that they have such a, a lead that it feels to me somewhat insurmountable. So it's one of those valuation situations that I'm, I mean, it's crazy, but but I feel it could keep going because NVIDIA is the turtle on whose back the entire AI industry rests on and the world is going that direction. So uh, I just didn't think it would happen that fucking fast, basically. I agree. I agree. But I think their moat is in jeopardy, but probably not this year. Like I read an article on uh, a tech forum a few weeks ago that kind of indicated that CUDA had lost the race to meta's competing framework which is more open source so i don't know that cuda is going to be like a massive tailwind for them forever and then a bunch of other folk are making their own hardware oh that's interesting well unless we we go too far in the nvidia rabbit hole i my understanding was that you can't use 
that there's some sort of tie-in between CUDA and NVIDIA chips. Once you have NVIDIA chips, you can't use another language. Is that incorrect? Uh, you can. You certainly can use others, but that's the most, uh, that's the highest performance combination, CUDA plus NVIDIA hardware right now. But I think developers are flocking more to other frameworks over CUDA. So we're going to see that play out into hardware at some point, but it wasn't this quarter. Okay, so there are two main takeaways from from this contest. One is NVIDIA beat estimates and is performing as well as a company could possibly perform. It's, it's borderline mind-boggling what they're doing, and it might be from one perspective just beginning. And the second takeaway is I'm going to be drunk on some good-ass found whiskey in about a month's time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm... Push the boat out. Take me somewhere nice and I'll buy you a, a, a decent flight. <laughs> All right. So the next item on our agenda is Enovix. With us is Mr. Not Advice, who is going to talk to us about the details of the latest earnings call and results from Enovix, which is a battery company that are looking to innovate the speed and efficiency of batteries. It's kind of a big deal. Lithium batteries have not been updated for a very long time, essentially since the 90s. And these guys have figured out from an engineering perspective a way to make batteries better. The problem is, uh, in as much as uh, in investing there are problems, this company is not yet making these batteries. So it has a valuation of several billion, but no revenue coming, coming in. So for all investors investing now in this company, it's a little bit of a tricky situation. And Mr. Not Advice, who uh, has his own Discord and can be found at mrnotadvice.com, knows how business works. And this is the kind of situation where his insights into how to interpret the latest earnings call can be very, very invaluable. So with that, Mr. Not Advice, what did you hear? Well, thanks, uh, first of all, having me back. And after listening to your NVIDIA contest, I'm glad to be the adult in the room this morning. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I actually, uh, you know, I was encouraged uh, by their, their conference call. I was encouraged at their uh, Fab 2, so their, their primary line of production. Uh, is ahead of schedule. Um, but I think, you know, it's, it's always for me about timing, right? And, and, you know, is it the right time? Is it the right time to get in? And a couple things that I heard uh, first, there was, I think, you know, some of the uh, retail was pretty excited about their revenue, but we have to remember that that revenue was purchased. Uh, that's from, it's from Route Jade. So they, they bought that revenue and and in previous comments, I've made the comment that they, I believe on a, uh, a valuation basis, they overpaid for that revenue. Uh, Route Jade was not a growing company. They were actually uh, year over year, the latest numbers were up to 21 to 22, and they had showed a 10% decline in revenue. So, but I understand. Um, the, the, the other thing that um, I wanted to point out was you know, and I made this comment to my members, I said, you know, they didn't mention anything about the medical device contract that they had talked about before. They didn't mention anything about the army contract that they talked about before. And when I, when I say mention, what I want to hear is unit numbers, right? I want to hear contract size because analysts, in order to do price protection or projections, they have to have those numbers in order to justify their projected price. So as an example, the Army contract. Uh, we have a member, Just Jake, he, he, you know, he was doing some research. He said, hey, on that Army contract, Anivix is actually a partner. They're working with a company called Inventus Power, okay? But Inventus is just one company that is trying to get the final contract, okay? There hasn't been a final contract been awarded. And the estimated time for completion for that contract is 2030. So this is a, in my mind, this is a good example of there's the story, right? And then there's the stock. 
So from a story standpoint, you hear, and they mentioned the Army contract on previous calls and podcasts, and it, it was exciting, right? And But if you dig a little deeper and you realize, you say, wait a minute, this if they get the contract for the full size, it's not going to be realized until 2030. So that's probably why, multiple reasons why they didn't mention any numbers, right? And so, you know, they... The story that they put out, you know, we got a medical device contract, we got a uh, army contract. We, or they didn't say we got the contract. They said we're we're working with the army to deliver batteries, right? So it's listening to the verbiage that they're actually saying. Because remember, when they speak, it becomes part of the material record, and they have to be factual. So that's why, you know, parsing the words and understanding what they're really saying. And, and I think this sell-off in Enovix right now, I'm actually more excited now, okay, because of the progress they're making on their primary line, their Fab 2 line, I'm more excited now from an operational standpoint than I was two months ago. However, the reaction to the stock price tells me that I'm not the only person, okay, that's maybe getting a little weary, tired, waiting for some real numbers, some real, a new customer. They mentioned uh, that they are in a development um, relationship with a uh, automaker, right? To, to develop uh, EV batteries. Well, a development contract or relationship, that is not revenue producing, okay? That's simply, we're gonna work with a Hyundai or Kia and. Those are the two that are at the top of my list who it could be. Um, you know, from the Hyundai or Kia standpoint, there's no risk to do development contract with Enovix, right? Either their batteries work and they can make it work or they don't. They're not outlying, uh, outlaying any capital for that. If they were, I promise you Enovix would have mentioned that. So I think what we have right now is, and what I'm looking for is, um, at some point, and I don't know what that price point is, but at some point, if you believe in the story, okay, and if you believe they will announce a major customer, it's a, it's sort of a no-brainer, okay, to to buy this to buy this stock at the right price. Though I, I was encouraged by their update. Um, I, I liked their video presentation touring the factory, but at the end of the day. The demarcation between a company story and a stock, um, it, it's important to realize that there is a right time. I mean, you can, you know, I'm looking at this stock and I'm thinking I'm going to get a chance to buy this thing somewhere around nine bucks. Okay. And the day, uh, the day that they came out with earnings, I made a tweet and I said, it's going to 10. And we hit that very quickly. And I think that was just a lot of people who are expecting, uh, they're gonna announce big earnings, new customer, uh, and they were disappointed. Uh, right now, all it's done is it's gone back into the same price area that it's been in since October, okay? So it's not as if it's making new lows. If we break 895, 833, my, my number is, if it breaks 895, the price is gonna get ugly. Um, because I, I think there are a lot of people um, that bought into this stock, uh, and certainly if it breaks the 52-week low at 833. But instead of me looking at this like, oh, I will, I'll short it, I'm looking now for an entry to get long, okay? Because I see all the capital they're deploying in their, in their uh, equipment, in their manufacturing, and I have to believe that they're not spending money without at least a very good idea of getting a contract. It, it would make no sense to me. Okay, yeah, that, that, thanks for all those insights, Mr. Nut Advice. Badger, I have a question for you. So you're not particularly invested or uh, in Envix, uh, but you have a good outsider's perspective. So let me paint this picture for you and, and get your insight. On the one hand, you have Mr. Not Advice saying, look, we need numbers, but we're not getting numbers. So this is a pure story stock. 
and I'm going to use some technical analysis to help me time my, my entry point. He's seeing it sort of both ways and just kind of thinking about it mathematically, probabilistically, right? Uh, after he posted some of his insights on Twitter, it was fascinating. There was a quick reply from, from some investor that said, <laughs> said somewhat angrily, then buy the stock at $30 plus when they have the line up and running. Until then, shut up. And so, <laughs> uh, what do you what, what do you think of this kind of uh, you know uh, animosity to somebody saying the story is not enough for me? It's a bunch of stuff to unpack there, which translates directly into like my approach as a long term investor. I really the idea of like the real business outcomes. And the story really resonates with me because I invest in stories also. But if I invest in a story, like I've always got in my mind, what are the tangible outcomes I'm going to see on the balance sheet or I'm going to see in terms of deliveries or something I can really stick a pin into. And, and I'm just tracking those things. That's my thesis. I'm tracking those things. And when they start to land, I'm expecting the valuation to start to reflect those at some point. And that's how you kind of get early. So I've got no problem investing in stories. And the guy with the, uh, you know, the attack, diff different approach. Like some people don't want to invest in super early companies. That also makes sense. You know, you can run a portfolio quite successfully investing in more mature companies, but you miss out on, well, you, you miss out on the, the extreme level of risk when you get in super early, but also mm -hmm. correspondingly, like the potential of multi, multi, multi bagger returns because you're coming to the party once like the canapes have already been served. You're not getting there early. Um, maybe, maybe to bring it back to Inovix specifically, beyond the story and, you know, stuff that's not material, like contracts that don't really, or deals with partners that don't really have any missing material behind them, are there specific business events coming up in the next 24, 36 months that really will be clear catalysts for growth? You know, I think that that's that's the unknown, right? We we don't know what they have in their hip pocket. You know, we can only go off what the me. I, I can only go off of what they've said and how close to their execution it has been to what they have said, right? And of course, I understand all businesses have delays. Okay, uh, you know, my recollection is in the third quarter they talked about naming a customer, in the fourth quarter they didn't. Okay, my recollection uh, was they were very excited to announce the army and the uh, medical device, but we don't have any unit numbers. And so I, 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 these guys are smart, okay? They know that they need to keep this stock, okay, above five bucks for sure, all right, until they announce a contract. My unknown is, well, when is that going to be? But I look at the cash position of the company, they got plenty of cash, okay? I don't, I mean, the worst thing that happens to a stock is the company goes out of business. I don't see them going out of business in the next 12 months, right? But I would say that they are, the clock is ticking that what you were talking about, they need, they need to now start speaking to deliverables, right? How many units are they gonna produce? And, and, and I do, I am, uh, I, I am empathetic to their position because I don't see an Apple or a Samsung giving them a huge contract until they can, they can prove they can produce at scale, right? But so it's like a chicken and the egg. So in the other, the final thing I would say is, let's say I wait until they name a big customer. And let's say this stock goes from today, nine bucks to over 25. Well, if they name a big customer, then it only validates my belief in the story, okay? Therefore, my original target on Enovix with a big customer, and other than Loop Capital, I was the highest, I was at $90, okay? Because I literally, I really believe once they name a big customer, they need that flagship sort of like anchor customer because other customers are watching too, right? Potential customers. Once they do that, whether I got it at nine or whether I got it at 25, I, my upside is still multiples, right? 
But if I buy it here at nine, okay, without a new customer, I'm not seeing a, a definable and predictable catalyst within my investment horizon saying, I may not be able to get it cheaper. So my issue is not, should I buy the company? You know, I, I've always wanted to buy into the stock, right? But my issue is, when should I buy the company? Um, if that makes sense. It, it sure does. And I think it points to one of the most fundamental and difficult things about being a successful investor, regardless of the time frame you use. You need patience. You need discipline. And I think it, I've made this mistake too many times than, than I'd like. When I got big googly eyes over the story, I, because I guess I'm a natural optimist, I want it to be true. I have money riding on it, and and I think, wow, all the all these gains ahead of me, right? I believe the story, and so I'm going to get in now. Whereas usually, correct me if I'm wrong, Badger, or correct me if you, if you see it differently. Usually, the better thing to do, and you you both used the magic word before, is manage your risk, hmm. wait for the 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 legit fundamentals to be true rather than hopeful and then so what if you miss 30 percent if it goes up another thousand right mm -hmm. so but that requires the kind of reining in your your horses and i think there's a like we're painting this as a black and white thing you're a shareholder you're not a shareholder and that's not the case right it's very great like you can take a position gradually mm -hmm. you could take a small position at extreme risk at this lower share price or an even lower share price in a, in a month's time doesn't mean you can't add when you start to see the thesis starting to play out. Yeah, right. I mean, as they develop their business model, um, I, I think if they announce, it doesn't have to even be a Samsung uh, or an Apple. If they just announce who, because obviously they're working with, what, two or three out of the top five OEM uh, cell phone manufacturers. But we also heard in that, that, that latest earnings call that I think it was six, the question was how many SKUs, right? How many SKUs are you working on? It was six. So that tells me it's six phones, okay? Now, they, those could be massive contracts, but you know you could take that two ways. Well, that's not a lot, or ah, that's exactly what I would expect for a starter contract. And I truly believe that when they announce, if and when they announce a customer, okay, with a contract, it will be, it will remove a tremendous amount of downside risk. And more importantly, it's gonna make the institutional com community extremely happy. Because right now they're modeling off of the same thing we're trying to model off of, right? We're trying to guess size of the contract, number of units, and it's, it's impossible to do. So, you know, I've said this before when we've talked, they, they need institutional support. They need institutional support, not, you know, people who get super angry because they take it personal that somebody has a different opinion, right? And once they have that, I think this volatility to the downside is, is going to transfer to operational execution, right? Whether you know, Maybe they have a hiccup on the line or whatever. Um, that's where we want to be with this company. We want to be that they have now fulfilled the business cycle. They've gone from startup, to development and now they're into sales because i really think after that first customer we're, they're going to get other customers lined up and they're going to happen quickly and that's why i still believe if they can name that customer within 12 months this company all things being equal the thing could easily 4x 4x from this price so i do want to get long the stock it's just you know I'm not going to say it's a company maker, but in this case, that is honestly the only overhang that's that's left, right? And I'd like to throw out one concrete uh, tangible to look for. In April, management said they're on target to ship qualifying units. That's when essentially these batteries at some uh, reasonable mass production get shipped out to to lots of potential customers where they then go on and try them out and that cycle usually lasts about nine to twelve months and so what we have now is a tighter 
time frame that's reasonable. If they, first of all, they can't delay the April date, but it seems like they're on target, so the market was happy about that, or that at least that was a positive. And then the clock starts ticking. So I think what Mr. Not Advice is saying is once April hits and they send out those units, we have about nine to 12 months in which we should see some of those customer orders and big contracts. If we don't, that's a huge, huge skull mm -hmm. and crossbones. Mm -hmm. And I also think that that, that delivery, uh, you know, the, as you said, it's a nine to 12 month after that. So then we have to look at realization of revenues, right? But it's an entirely different picture you're looking at if the actual component is in the OEM manufacturer's hands, right? I mean, it's not as if Enovix is, is designing these batteries uh, and primarily the design process is about physically fitting it inside into the real estate of the phone case. I mean, that's what they've been talking about. It, it's not about the technology, okay? So I, I, I think that whatever company it is, and again, Samsung, I think that if those uh, tests over those nine to 12 months, uh, and it could be quicker. I mean, it, it really could be quicker because of the technology potential here, right? Um, I really think that if that there are orders, contracts behind and of size, I, I think it's going to be, if this works, Enovix is going to be one of those companies where you wake up someday and the stock is up 50 to 100% because they've announced that big, huge contract. And that's what I fear, actually, is I'm going to be left behind, is I'm not going to get a chance, you know, but I'm okay, again, giving up some of the front end because I see the potential. I mean, if they are truly the only company that can do this, and from what I see, they are, okay, and they can get the um, their batteries uh, to meet their technological specifications on recharging and cycle cycle time, I, I think that they're going to have a monopoly, quite frankly. Yeah, I mean, those are right. I mean, the, the massive potential gains here are why we're talking about this, mm -hmm. uh, because th these are setups that don't come along too often. I want to make a I want to summarize for some of our listeners what I think is the the big picture here. On one hand, we have a lot of excitement about the story because of the potential. It's obvious. On the other hand, there's a lot of risk still on the table because as Mr. Advice was, was foregrounding, the numbers and the contracts are not there. They're invisible and they're being uh, professionally teased. teased, right? And so what's an what's a investor to do? I think to be patient is is one fundamental key. Do not do not get overexcited. And then you have two, I think, practical moves you can make. Go to seveninvesting.com, read my report about the fundamentals of Envix. That's where you will learn about the actual batteries architecture, silicon anodes, and why this is why this company is potentially such a big deal. Then check out Mr. Not Advice's site where he schools people about thinking in terms of risk management and price action. And I think if you could hold both of these uh, approaches in your head simultaneously, the long-term story, the emotional discipline, and uh, risk management, you are in good shape as an mm -hmm. investor. Badger, would you like some, to add something to that uh, ingredient, to those ingredients? No, that sounds robust, right? And in some ways, you're starting to lean there philosophically on like the Wall Street Wildlife 10 laws of the jungle. Patience is a key one of those. If you try and think you're smarter than the pack and try and get way, way ahead of consensus, like that's a recipe for disaster, potentially. And I, and I, would, I would also add... You know, I've got a lot of members who, are, who own Enovix in the high teens, okay? Um, and, and I just did a, a, a live session yesterday on how to uh, simply buy protection and actually get paid to do it with a covered call. And I've encouraged members, hey, even if you don't know anything about options, 
learn just this one thing, because that way you can long-term hold any stock. And through, uh, as you're holding, you can constantly be reducing your basis. But most importantly, you will have protection. So if it does move against you in the short term, for whatever reason, because of the volatility, you're protected or maybe make even a little money to lower your basis. I just believe that there's so many unknowns out there. We, we don't know that it's wise, I think, to constantly looking at method, simple methods to be able to protect your, your long-term core holding, you know? Um, because it, it, it can get a little bit defeating to have such a great story, right? And then see the stock move down 30% in a week. I mean, that's, that's but to understand why it's doing that, it, it, like I said, the potential now, the story is better today than it was a month ago. I'm more positive about them today than I was. Now it's, for me, it's just the price I'm gonna get in at. And then I need to see what we do here in that $9 range, because I will establish a long position soon because of what you know you said about this April date. I think that's gonna, that's gonna, that's gonna cause a pop in the stock, quite frankly. Uh, when they announce we've delivered those units, right? Uh, for, you know, for review, I think that's gonna, and I'd like to be in it before then. If I'm not, I'm not, but I am looking to get long this stock. All right, so uh, I hope that was useful for all our listeners. You could find the important information that we talked about both at the seveninvesting.com website and Mr. Night Advice. Uh, dot com. Mr. Nod Weiss, uh, any last parting words? No, oh, thank you for having me today. And I, I, I always enjoy talking to you guys, really. Good stuff. Bringing, always bringing an interesting counter view to the long-term investor. So we do welcome that. Thank you, Mr. Nod Advice. Thank you. So I hope you enjoyed today's episode of Wall Street Wildlife. We're on YouTube and all major podcast platforms. Um, I'm going to plug a couple of things. I mentioned just now the laws of the jungle. We've written them. Christoph is turning them into a beautiful artifact. We're going to have them live on the website very, very soon. So check out wallstreetwildlife.com where you'll be able to download those. I'd also like to plug an upcoming social media push. I'm, I'm going to drive through March and I'm going to reveal my entire real money investment portfolio. And I'm going to release a video every day telling you why I own each of those stocks and how I've traded it in some ways. You know, I don't really trade as a long-term investor, but I have definitely bought and sold stuff over time. I'm going to tell you why I did each of those and lessons I learned, either because I made a mistake or I got lucky or things just played out the way I expected. So um, check in with our Instagram, check in with us on Twitter, on X, and you'll be able to hear that story day by day through March. In fact, uh, our Twitters are Mr. Not Advice. Correct. At seven Luke Hallard is is Badger and I am at seven Flying Platypus. Uh, we are both lead advisors with seveninvesting.com. And if you subscribe with coupon code Wildlife, you'll get a handsome discount off an annual membership. We're also still running a one dollar one week trial. So guys, it's gonna cost you a dollar to check out Christoph's excellent writing on Innovix plus hundreds of other companies. So do swing by there and uh, check us out. And Mr. Not Advice, uh, members can find you. Uh, how do they get to your Discord? Um, and, uh, if you go to www.mrnotadvice.com uh, and about halfway through the page, you'll see the Discord link. Um, and I encourage people, if you have interest, to join because we're uh, now over 240 members and I will be putting it behind a paywall um, down the road here. And those who get in now will never pay. And so um, uh, the website is really the, uh, the, the source where you can find uh, not only uh, my blog posts and newsletters and all that, but how to get to Discord. Good chat, gentlemen. Are you ready to become a beast of an investor? Your journey starts here. Oh, <laughs> <laughs>
A reminder that the people on this program may hold positions in the companies that are mentioned. Buying and selling stock carries financial risk, which could include loss of capital. The views in this program should not be taken as personalized advice. Before acting on any of the information provided, listeners are encouraged to consult a financial or tax professional.